Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Marianne Mason, Dean of the Graduate Division, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you today for the Douglas and uh, the, the Charles and Martha Hitchcock Lecture Series, and particularly to welcome our distinguished guest, Professor Dudley Hirschbach. As a, re as a requirement of this lecture, and actually a very happy one, because it's a great pleasure, we're obliged to tell you something about how this bequest came about. And it's an interesting story, because you learn a little of San Francisco lore and how the university has always been supported by the community, particularly in terms of endowments and literature and literary events, et cetera. And uh, Charles Hitchcock actually was a doctor in the army uh, in the early 19th century, and then came to San Francisco uh, uh, in the gold rush, and fortunately he did pretty well. He got, I think, fairly rich. He continued practicing as a doctor, but he had a literary salon, and all the traveling literary folks would go there. Robert Louis Stevenson was there, a number of Berkeley professors attended, and he was so much part of the cultural and intellectual scene that he thought the best thing he could do was to perpetuate it at his favorite university, although he wasn't a student here because this was obviously before his time. So he endowed a professorship in, nine, in 1885. Um, it, his daughter similarly was inclined toward generosity and toward civic spirit, so she continued his tradition and bless her heart, Lily, who was a local colorful character as well, uh, continued and grew the original bequest, leaving us with a very nice endowment which allows us to invite the best minds in the world. If you look at your, your brochure, you'll see a, a litany of who's who in terms of American thought and achievement. It's, it's truly splendid to have this. I guess the secret is you should start your endowment at least 100 years ago. <laughs> Uh, and now I'd like to introduce Professor Bill Lester, Professor of Chemistry, who will formally introduce our distinguished visitor. Bill? Uh, you go, if I go down. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Dean Mason. Good afternoon. I'm William Lester. Uh, professor of Chemistry and Chair of the uh, Hitchcock Professorship Committee. On behalf of the uh, Hitchcock Professorship, we're pleased to welcome Professor Dudley Hirschbach as this year's speaker in the Charles M. and Martha Hitchcock Lecture Series. Uh, early in his career, while a young faculty member at UC Berkeley, Hirschbach undertook experiments using molecular beams to resolve the dynamics of chemical reactions in single collisions. This method made accessible many properties otherwise obscured by myriad random collisions and ultimately led to the Nobel Prize. He describes it in metaphorical terms. Bulk chemical experiments are like trying to study human psychology by flying a blimp over a stadium and listening to the shouts and murmurs of the crowd. Molecular beams, in effect, let us eavesdrop on conversations between pairs of molecules and even ask them questions directly. His current research interests include excursions into biophysics, a novel dimensional scaling approach to electronic structure, and high pressure chemistry, which many of us heard yesterday afternoon. He also writes historical and popular articles intended to foster public understanding of science. Dudley Hirschbach received his B.S. in mathematics in 1954 and M.S. in chemistry in 1955 from Stanford University. He earned both an A.M. in physics, 1956, and a Ph.D. in chemical physics, 1958, from Harvard University. Hirschbach taught in the chemistry department here, UC Berkeley, from 1959 to 1963. He then returned to Harvard, where he has been the Frank B. Baird, Jr., Professor of Science since 1976, and has served as chair of both the chemical physics program 
1964 to 1977, and the chemistry department, 1977 to 1980. He has also long served as chair of the Board of Trustees of Science Service, which publishes Science News and conducts Intel's Science Talent Search and International Science and Engineering Fair for high school students. First box awards and honors include the Linus Pauling Medal in 1978, the Michael Polanyi Medal in 1981, Nobel Prize in 1986, shared with Yuman Lee and John Polanyi, and the National Medal of Science in 1991. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the Royal Chemical Society of Great Britain, among others. In 1998, he was named by Chemical and Engineering News among the 75 leading contributors to the field of chemistry since the 1920s. It is great to have Dudley back on the West Coast from whence he started. 30 years ago, I was able to persuade him to give a talk at a conference on potential energy surfaces in chemistry that I co-organized that also returned him to Northern California. Even then, Dudley's contributions to energy transfer and reactions of molecules were propelling understanding. We are in for a real treat from an exciting, dynamic speaker who continues to probe fundamental issues of molecular phenomena. Finally, yesterday, I learned that Dudley Hirschback's talents in the public domain are not limited to science. In the past year, he had a role, or should I say his voice had a part on the TV program, The Simpsons. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dudley Hirschbach. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I first met Bill on the basketball court at a scientific meeting. You know, give you an idea. Science is not all tough, grim work. But it's a great pleasure for me to visit California. I'm a third generation native of San Jose. And I was delighted to hear the story of his shock lectures and see it was connected with the gold rush because my ancestors on my father's side, it's obviously a German name, were among the many who fled uh, to the U.S. in 1848. Most of them settled in the Midwest, but the most reckless ones continued in 49 out to the gold rush. They didn't do nearly as well as Charles Hitchcock, but uh, sort of a compensation somehow come about, and I'm awfully happy about it. Particularly, it's great to come to Berkeley. Uh, I was a faculty member, you heard, here from 59 to 63, and got started on this work on intimate encounters with molecules. But the reason I did uh, is Harold Johnston, who's back there, who had been my undergraduate mentor since my freshman year at Stanford. I remember vividly, he was the first professor I ever met because I was the first in our family to go to college. We didn't even know anyone who'd been to college. And this young assistant professor, then Hal Johnston, was nothing like what I imagined a professor would be, you know, a sort of dignified, stuffy guy. And he explained right away that a university had three missions. One was to prefer, preserve, another to transmit knowledge, and the third to produce knowledge. Well, of course, the first two were not surprising, but I don't think I'd ever heard of research <laughs> until then. And I remember vividly how he described some of his own research, which was trying to unravel how chemical reactions actually occurred at the molecular level. I thought then, as he described it, that was clearly a fine, enterprising thing to do, but it was awfully tough because he emphasized what you mentioned in my <laughs> metaphor of the blimp over the stadium, that an awful lot goes on and makes it tough. So. Um, I thought on this occasion it was especially appropriate 
to talk to you about work that started here at Berkeley and has many, many connections to Berkeley, some of which I hope I mention along the way. So the general motivation, oh, I should mention, uh, you see today's title, Taming Molecular Wildness, is the general theme. It's kind of an odyssey. Uh, and next time I'll talk about breaking and making chemical bonds, which is the heart and soul of chemistry. The magic of it all is fundamentally transforming one substance into another uh, with maybe quite different properties and trying to understand how that comes about, how we may hopefully and steer it in a direction we'd like to see happen. But the general theme is well illustrated on the next biograph. This is a poster I saw in the subway in San Francisco when I was here just a few years ago to take part in a celebration of Harold Johnston's distinguished career. And I was quite delighted. It satisfies me on a molecular level. That's a great motivation uh, for many people, and it certainly was for me. Um, now, as uh, you've heard already from Bill, you have a few problems if you're doing it in bulk matter. There's so much going on with all these molecules interacting. And since right now the Red Sox are playing for their survival, um, I can show you this poster. It was a cartoonist who illustrated um, an article reporting a talk I gave. <laughs> and I think I mentioned that, uh, suppose that the only way you could watch baseball was to have all the teams in the same stadium, all the batters swinging and the pitchers pitching and so on at the same time. That's the general situation you have when you do chemistry in a test tube or equivalent kind of bulk situation. Uh, probably baseball would not be terribly popular. Certainly the players would not command the salaries they do and all the rest. <laughs> With, this, with chaos like that going on. So that's the motivation for hoping you could develop a means to see, as I say, the intimate molecular level details of what happens when individual molecules collide and react. Now, there's a wonderful history behind the work that we and others undertook to achieve that, as I say, starting at Berkeley. And it's especially delightful that it goes back to Otto Stern, the man on the right here. The guy on the left needs no introduction. But I chose this picture because, as many of you must know, this year uh, is celebrating the centennial of Einstein finally managing to get his PhD. Uh, it's called his miracle year because in that year he published, in addition to completing his PhD, four papers that transformed the understanding of physics and from which uh, tremendous consequences followed. So there have been many celebrations all over the world of that miraculous year. But Otto Stern retired and was living in Berkeley. I did not know that at the time. I undertook work which, as you'll see, is a descendant of his in the sense that he was the sort of uh, great grandfather of work with what are called molecular beams that allow you to get information about what happens in individual molecular encounters. So I want to start with that story. He got his PhD in 1912 for research on solutions of carbon dioxide in various solvents. I point that out because if there are young students, graduate students in the audience, it might be nice to know that a man like Otto Stern started work on generalized soda pop 
CO2 and various solutions. And that means that don't worry too much if your PhD thesis is not all that earth-shaking. Uh, there's a lot of future ahead of you, and it was in his case. His parents were so delighted that their son completed PhD in a good form that they offered to support him for a year to study where he wanted. And Stern, as I mentioned, was a chemist, but he'd heard of this guy, this young guy, who was only seven years young, older than he, Einstein, and he said, I'd like to go work with that guy. Uh, well, he wrote Einstein. Einstein said, sure. In fact, Stern was the first postdoctoral fellow Einstein ever had. At that time, Stern, uh, Einstein, although it's seven years already after what we now call his miracle year, uh, had just accepted an academic position, the first one with a full professorship that he ever had, in Prague. And Stern went there to join him. Uh, they would have their weekly meetings in a cafe attached to a brothel. I mention that detail because it's a quick way to give the impression what science of this kind was like back then. It was like poetry. It was artistic. It was bohemian. This is very much the case. You know, as, as uh, Bill mentioned, I love history and I've enjoyed finding out these illuminating details. Okay, but now uh, among other things, Stern developed his taste working with Einstein for what people call Gedanken experiments. Einstein is famous for talking about what happens when elevators fall and when trains pass by and you think out in an uh, idealized model way. And that's what this business of molecular beams is, as you'll see. It's a Gedanken experiment, except one you can actually do in the lab. <laughs> A thought experiment done in the lab. Okay, I want to quick next quickly give you um, this is a, a quick historical scan on a vertical scale. You see, uh, Stern's work, uh, which I was delighted to be able to hear about from him in person when I was here in 1960 uh, and met him, not knowing before, as I mentioned, that he had retired to Berkeley. His first work was in 1920, not long after the invention of the vacuum pump, uh, right around the turn of the century, made it possible to get good enough vacuums. You see, you needed to be able to evacuate the sort of native molecules from some chamber in order to make it possible for the molecules you want to form into a beam to travel through the chamber without bumping into a lot of the ordinary residents. Uh, for example, in atmospheric conditions such as we're in right now, uh, there are a tremendous number of molecules bumping into one or another. You can't, an individual molecule can't get very far. It takes days, if the air were completely still, to get from here to that door because there's a bump on its way through all the other molecules. But with a evacuated chamber, the vacuums were only capable of producing a small chamber then the size of a quart jar, say. Early experiments were done. The very first one with the Frenchman, Dunaway, uh, he, he showed that you could evaporate, in this case he made a sodium beam, and block it with a obstacle that sort of cast a shadow. He called it molecular rays. I don't know what shape it was, but since it was French, I guess this is an appropriate shape. And then Stern in 1920 did a measurement of the distribution of velocities. A uh, very, very ingenious way. He collected silver atoms that had been evaporated from a hot wire in a vacuum in a rotating apparatus that spread the velocity distribution away. He could detect it. Then in 1922, he with Gerlach did a stunning experiment that had a huge impact on the thinking of physicists. And since I got to hear him tell a particularly uh, striking story about the Stern Gerlach experiment, I want to say just a bit about it. Uh, as you'll see, it gave birth to many other things. 
Uh, there was speculation in these early days when people were trying to figure out what was the basic mechanics of the interaction of electrons with nuclei, which only a few years before had really been recognized as constituents of matter. Uh, there was speculation about how they moved. And you probably, many of you have heard of the Bohr model, Niels Bohr model, it had an electron in sort of a planetary orbit around a proton and a hydrogen atom. Well, Stern said, in telling me about this work, that one morning he woke up after a seminar thinking about a, a question raised in the seminar. Now, I hope some of you may have the same experience. It's very pleasant. Uh, it does, however, interfere with a theorem I've quoted many times due to George Pimentel. Gene. George kindly told me once, I was grateful, that if you don't fall asleep in seminars, you aren't working hard enough. I was falling asleep a lot. So it's okay if anybody wants to fall asleep here, it's good evidence. He woke up, it was too early to go to the lab, so he stayed in bed, too cold to get out of bed, he said. So he thought about the question. The question was, well, if the electron is going around, it should generate a magnetic field. A moving charge generates a magnetic field. And there's two ways. It could go this way or that way. So if you put a magnetic field on, this little magnet should orient this way or that way. Now, some theorists had discussed this as sort of a hypothetical thing, but nobody believed it. It meant that different directions in space would be different. We call it space quantization. It has nothing to do with space colonization, incidentally, just space. The idea by then that energy might have just definite values, so-called quantum of energy, that was okay. But to think that directions, only special directions could be taken by properties of matter, that seemed ridiculous. And when he proposed to his boss, the head of the institute, to do this, it was like, come on, that's absurd. And Terence said, I want to try it anyway. So they did, and obviously succeeded, or I wouldn't be mentioned. <laughs> they said it was a difficult experiment to do then. They sent it through a magnetic field where there's a, a, a strong electro, or, or a pole piece that has a strong field on one side and a weaker field on the other. And by golly, the beam of silver atoms that were using split into two. It was astonishing. Einstein suffered trying to explain how this could happen in the context of existing theory then, in 1922, didn't succeed. It was only later that something that we call electron spin was recognized three years later that it became really clear what had happened. But it turns out that electron spin is one of the most important things in understanding the chemical structure of matter. Uh, at any rate, this experiment, simple as it is, had all sorts of, of successors because not only did it demonstrate this phenomenon of electron spin, the direction uh, of, of quantization, the directions in space, only certain directions could be allowed by quantum mechanics, but it showed that you could sort things out into different states, different orientations by this simple way. Well, not long after, a Dutchman named Gorter tried to do what we now call magnetic resonance. Because it recognized that in a magnetic field, you should have different energy levels from the interaction of these little temporary magnets, that you could make a radiation uh, change which state was occupied, and therefore do what we call spectroscopy. However, because it was known then, already in the 30s, that a nucleus was a tiny thing, 100,000 times smaller than the size of the atom as a whole, it wasn't clear that you could expect it to interact. Just as sitting here, it's not obvious that when Bill nods off, I'm just kidding, he's very alert, that some galaxy out there knows it. You know, there's such a big difference in distance scale. So Gorder tried the experiment and failed. Why? Because before the field is turned on, the levels are the same. It's the field that makes the energy different. And therefore, the populations are the same. 
when the field is turned on, the levels now are different, but the population is still the same unless what we call relaxation occurs. And the higher energy ones, become, a state becomes less populated. But that only happens if there's interaction with the external world to allow a readjustment of population. Yeah, I guess I could cook up an analogy about what happens in an election, but I better not go there. At any rate, uh, with the right popular uh, advertising. In any case, so he went around giving seminars why you can't do spectroscopy on nuclei. And Robbie, who had worked with Stern, who's Columbia University then, heard this and he invented this method, tremendously powerful, that reveals so much. He recognized he could use a molecular beam to do spectroscopy without any difference in population. How? Well, he had a Stern Gerlach field A, just like that, that split a beam. He had another one he called B, that oriented the opposite way, that brought them back together. So if the molecule remains in the same state all the way through, nothing happens. Then in the middle, he put a uniform field, uh, which in itself just keeps the energy levels separate. And then he put radiation that induce a transition. So if a molecule starts out in this state, but changes state here, then it doesn't refocus. So the populations could be equal, but any change in here is detected. They gave a tremendously powerful way. This was the first NMR experiment. Uh, it was tried then later in solution by Block at Stanford, Purcell at Harvard, and of course you all know about magnetic resonance in hospitals. Alex Pines at Berkeley has done mir miraculous things all the time. He told me about some more just this morning. It's one of the most powerful tools science has, and has been for all this science. And it grows directly, the successor from uh, Stern Gerlach because the states you're talking about are these states that differ in orientation, space quantization. Okay, then it prompted in the 50s some early attempts to do chemistry. I'll come back to them because this is the line that we're going to follow. But I have to mention first the evolution of the laser. Everyone who has a CD player or checks out groceries <laughs> now knows about lasers. How did they begin? Well, again, their ancestor was the Stern Gerlach experiment. Uh, in that, Charles Towns tried with a molecular beam to have a set up of fields such that when he sent a beam of ammonia through, the molecules that were transmitted were the ones mostly in an upper state, and the one in the lower state got deflected. So the population was in the upper state. That meant when he sent in radiation of the right frequency, the molecules upstairs wanted to fall down to the lower energy state. And they, they emitted then radiation of the same magnitude that tickled them to fall down, because that's the idea of quantization, it depends on the spacing of the levels. And so you had a molecular amplifier. And then that was generalized and went on in solid state and so on to be the lasers and the, in particular the one I'm using right now is a laser pointer. It's a tremendously valuable thing. It all grew from this. I go into this in such detail just to emphasize the romance in my mind of it all. How such rude maverick beginnings can over time unfold in a lovely way like this. So uh, among this main line that fall, you could say sprouted from the roots of the Stern Gaelic experiment was laser spectroscopy. I don't know uh, how many tens of thousands of experiments are going on all over the world using lasers in that way now. Uh, you'll see a little about cluster beams I may mention, and so on. So let me move on a little more briskly. Um, here is a, a picture of the Stern Gerlach Monument in, in Frankfurt. I had the privilege of going to take part in the dedication ceremony of a new lab there. That's where the experiment was done. Here's their magnetic field and the sculpture and so on. Uh, now, as the, another ancestral thing I want to acknowledge in this odyssey of intimate encounters with molecules is this beautiful, conceptually beautiful and simple apparatus of Michael Polanyi.
I was delighted to learn that he gave here the Hitchcock lectures in, 19, in 17, uh, 1974, excuse me, uh, as, uh, he is a hero of mine, and in particular, of course, the father of John Plany, a dear friend who, as you heard from Bill, uh, enjoyed the same party I did with Yuan in, in Stockholm in 86. The ingenious thing that in the early 20s, again, Michael Plany did, was take a tube, it was a yard long or so, Really, we should say meter, of course, but I want to be non-technical. And it's filled with argon at ordinary sort of pressures. And then you diffuse sodium, dear old sodium again, it's convenient to use, through one end. So the, there was a gradient of concentration as you went further in the tube, fewer and fewer sodium atoms diffusing along. And the other end, chlorine. And in the middle, where the joint concentration of sodium and chlorine was largest, here it is, why you had maximum probability of reaction. And furthermore, you got a salt deposit, sodium chloride, you're all familiar with. And because you could estimate quite well the diffusion rate, how fast sodium and chlorine could diffuse, from measuring the width of the salt deposit, you could figure out how fast the reaction occurred in this region where you had the overlapping concentration. And he could put in different reagents and in that way survey the variation reaction rate with chemical structure. That was the first systematic study of how the rates of chemical reactions were related to the molecular structure, which of course is part of the key thing we want to talk about next time. Uh, there were other striking things. The reason it was called a diffusion flame was to a surprise, you got emitted the sodium yellow light, you see in sodium lamps, just from this. And how to figure that out? Well, it led to remarkable understanding when sodium reacts with diatomic chlorine to form sodium chloride, that re releases a lot of energy because the sodium chloride bond is a lot stronger than the diatomic chlorine-chlorine bond. That energy then can be taken up in a sodium atom when another sodium atom collides with a newly formed sodium chloride. That was one path. It turns out he decided there was another path. A little bit of the sodium occurs as diatomic sodium molecules, Na2, very weakly bound. And the, sodium, the chlorine atom that's released when in the primary reaction sodium reacts with diatomic chlorine to give sodium chloride plus chlorine that chlorine atom could attack the diatomic sodium to release even more energy because the sodium dimer is so weakly bound and the sodium chloride is so strongly bound, enough to produce excitation. And Margaret Clark, who's back there in the dusk, uh, one of my graduate students, actually did a wonderful experiment exploring this mechanism. What she did was sodium chloride, it would happen to be potassium and bromine, to make potassium bromine that was highly vibrationally excited for just the reason we described here, and then collide it with a sodium beam to produce light. So she had three beams. That was really wonderful, one of my favorite experiments. But it, right now, my point is to get launched on talking about uh, taming molecular wildness. And I want to give one more historical reference it's a really ancient one, 6th century AD, by a uh, philosopher with the irresistible name of Simplicus. I was accused of making this up, but it's not true. There really was a guy named Simplicus, and he really said this, of course, in Greek. But uh, here is the whole idea of studying chemical reactions and single collisions and all. He said, the atoms move in the void, that's the vacuum, and catching each other up jostle together. And some recoil in any direction that may chance, and others become entangled with one another in various degrees, according to the symmetry of their shapes and sizes. Uncanny, sixth century. You'll see next time that, uh, what that, how, <laughs> how modern it is to look at that aspect. And positions and order, and they remain together 
And thus the coming into being of composite things is effected. Ah, go, Simplicus. I love it. Okay. Now that same guy who gave the baseball thing uh, illustrated in this series of cartoons what he thought crossing two molecular beams to study a chemical reaction in single collisions uh, was like. See, the basic idea we undertook, and uh, other people did too, was to have a vacuum system form one of these beams intersected with another one. The background molecules had been suppressed by pumping, so they didn't interfere. These beams travel without any collisions with the background. Without any, they're so dilute, they don't collide within the beam. So then the only chance when these two dilute beams cross each other is uh, individual ones might be close enough to collide and most of them will just bounce away a severe enough reaction they will uh, exchange uh, atoms and produce reaction but this is fun to see but it's completely misleading because uh, almost everything is wrong about it first of all our molecular hockey players if, they, if the molecules were size of hockey players would be 20 or 30 feet apart so you can see how most of them would just miss they aren't blindfolded, the molecules, as the cartoonist made them, uh, because they feel each other through long-range molecular forces. So they always produce some deflection, and you can measure it in these experiments and get information about those forces. Then when the collisions are hard enough, by chance, among these dilute beams crisscrossing, it doesn't just result in something like this. In a chemical reaction, it would be equivalent to exchanging an arm or a head or something between the players. It's much more vigorous than that. At any rate, that was the thing that motivated us, the picture we had in mind. And here's the apparatus we built at Berkeley to undertake this. Uh, we mean my first two graduate students, George Kwai and Sam Norris. Um, and I, and this is in principle extremely simple. Here's a chamber that's going to produce a beam of potassium atoms. This one's going to produce a beam of methyl iodide. I'll say why we chose that particular molecule. It's a methyl is a CH3, iodine's an iodine atom. Uh, they cross here and we're mounted on hanging from a rotating lid that uh, like the yoga boatman who could rotate with graduate student power to change the angle and then the products would fly into this very simple detector. Now there's various things left off here, cold shields to trap errant molecules, slits to collimate, whatnot, but this is the essence. It's not so, you know, very simple. And of course you had to have a good, va good vacuum. Now uh, to give you an idea, one of these beams was about that long the other one about that long, and we were running them at as much intensity as we felt we could. So they're crossing each other, and the detector is about that far away. What was the yield? <laughs> the yield corresponded to about a monolayer of product a month, if we were to collect it that way. Pretty low by chemical standards. The parent beams might contribute a monolayer a minute, so it gives an idea of the nature of the yield under these conditions. So that's why for so long people have thought, oh, the, come on, you can't study chemical reactions in this kind of way. Not enough intensity. But of course, Michael Polanyi had shown us that the reaction involving alkyl atoms, sodium, potassium, and so on, often did give pretty big yields in his salt deposits. So that's why we owe it to him to know where to start. So everyone in this field started with what I like to call the alkali age of molecular beam chemistry. Uh, it was thought that they were unrepresented reactions, but we'll talk more about that next time. So in fact, that was not the case. Uh, but you see, uh, it was wonderful in the early days, even with its primitive apparatus, we could study, as Polanyi had done, a whole range of molecules reacting with alkali atoms with a special circumstance that we knew only single collisions had occurred. So we could find out a property like any preferred direction in which they went. Um, 
here are three of my students, all who have special connections with Berkeley. Of course, they're all graduate students here. They got their PhDs here, Ron Herm, George Kwai, John Byerly. Uh, I choose this especially because Ron was leader on the faculty at Berkeley. Uh, George had a distinguished career, including years at Los Alamos and later at Livermore, uh, both in his scientific work and administrative work. John also was at Los Alamos quite a while and is now in an administration here at Berkeley. Once you've done molecular beam work, you can do almost anything. You know. <laughs> now, I want to mention especially George. Here's my favorite picture with a characteristic smile. Sadly, George died June 10th of a stroke. It's a terrible loss, but he was one of these magic people in the lab. He had hands that knew what to do, even if he'd never done anything like it before. And he, that was done outside the lab as well. He built a beautiful harpsichord, for example. So time doesn't permit me to say much about him, but I want to mention this because the people that were attracted to work with me as an assistant professor, undertaking something that a lot of wise people thought was a, a will of the wisp, even call it the lunatic fringe of chemistry, where people like George, who wanted to do something <laughs> like that. And in fact, uh, the early results, which you will see were very primitive and simple, got people excited. And that's the most valuable thing about science, to, open people's eyes to new possibilities. And I would say the most valuable thing of what our early work did was it attracted a whole new generation of young theorists. And one of the very most outstanding and best of them is sitting right there, Bill Miller, uh, who I think, uh, I don't know whether he had any qualms when he started out, but he, <laughs> he plunged into this field because it gave the possibility of actually now understanding what happened in single collisions. Well, look at the kind of questions we got out in the first early thing. Just where did the potassium iodide go, preferentially, when potassium reacts with potassium, uh, with uh, methyl iodide to form Ki? Why did we choose methyl iodide instead of something simpler like hydrogen iodide? In fact, uh, an important ancestral experiment had been done already before we got started by Taylor and Dots, who had studied potassium and HBr. And they detected the HBr in the same way we did. Uh, the virtue of the alkalis is a hot wire will turn the alkali atom and its salt into ions that you can detect with 100% sensitivity. Whereas pump oil and stuff floating around the background won't do it. Uh, so you didn't have to have ideal conditions. But the trouble is, if you uh, react, say, a potassium with an HBr or an HI, then the potassium bromide or iodide you have here is so heavy compared with the hydrogen that when you measure the distribution and angle of the salt molecule, it has to be just at the center of mass. And hydrogen's so light, it doesn't affect the motion. Now, some of you may remember from high school solving the problem of when you shoot an artillery shell and it blows up in mid-flight, what is the trajectory of the center of mass? <laughs> it doesn't matter whether it blow up or not, because the center of mass, by definition, is where all the mass would be if you stuck everything together. And you don't learn anything about relative motion there. But chemistry is all about relative motion. Right now, our center of mass is moving with the Earth's rotation and through the galaxy and so on. But I don't need to take that into account when I want to go shake hands with Bill or say something to someone else. So the human chemistry, the interaction moving together, doesn't matter at the center of mass. So what you need to do is pick a system where you can see the relative motion to understand what the chemical forces are. And that's the whole reason we're using methyl instead of hydrogen. I mentioned that just so you see how rudimentary it was. Furthermore, we didn't want to make it too heavy here because then this could scatter too far an angle. 
you see, by making it not, not, still a lot lighter than the iodine, it restricted the angular range. Because in the first experiments, for all we knew, it would scatter uniformly everywhere, and then the signal would have been too low to see. So that's the, I tell you these details just for fun, and I hope you get the flavor of this early work. Well, you measure on one filament, which is potass, uh, platinum filament, for reasons not understood there, would respond to uh, scattered potassium, so a lot of which scatter without reacting, but it comes down rapidly with angle, you see. And then the other a tungsten filament would respond to both potassium and potassium ida. You can see the bump here, the difference here is the potassium ida. But the fact that it was where it was told you that relative to the approach of the reactants, the potassium iodide must be scattered to wider angles, because there's a wider angle than where the center of mass would go, and therefore backwards with respect to the attacking potassium. So that meant repulsive energy released. I just tell you, that just from that bump, you learn already that. It may be hard to imagine that uh, scientists get excited about such a thing. Well, soon uh, my students wrapped, uh, mapped out a whole family. This is a small sample of alkali reaction, just to show you that when you plot what we're really interested in, what we call a scattering angle relative to how the reactants approach, here's the product, uh, the reaction that throws the product mostly backwards. Here's on a scale of the intensity, one that throws it mostly forwards, a huge peak, uh, potassium plus Br2. There the dominant uh, interaction is attractive, as this shows you, because the forces uh, operate in that way. And I just show you the carbon tet case is a very alkali case, the one that sort of went in between. The nature of the forces did that. We'll talk about why it comes out that way next time, but I want to just give you a quick sampling now. Now we'll move faster and faster. When we moved to Harvard, uh, fortunately, there came a new PhD from Berkeley, Yuan Li, who joined me. And I said to Yuan, uh, it's time to try to go beyond the alkali age. Let's see if we can build an apparatus that'll let us study reactions under these demanding conditions of molecular beings where you get such small yield that don't involve alkalis. That's much harder. For example, in our first study, we studied one of the early ones, hydrogen atoms reacting with chlorine molecules. Now, most of them miss, remember? Like those hockey players, they would miss. And they bounce around in the background. And they react there to form HCl, the same product that's formed when they succeed to react in a single collision. And molecules, by what they are, they sort of fill the space, rattle around. So you have to have a terrific discrimination if you're using mass spectroscopy against the background you get from the misses and the ones formed directly. In the alkali case, because alkalis and their salts would condense easily on a cold trap, all we had to do was have a, a liquid nitrogen cooled copper, and they all stuck. Whenever they hit, they stuck. So we had infinite pumping speed, essentially. That's not true for H reacting with chlorine and many, many other systems. Anyway, the upshot was we built an apparatus we called HOPE. You know, it's the other one was Big Bertha. We were calling, labeling, or naming an apparatus in a alphabetical way, but also <laughs> we hoped this would take us beyond that, and it did. Um, again, there's a rotating lid. I want to point out just two things. We designed it so we had a nested region before the product we wanted to detect flew in and got ionized, turned into being bombarded by electrons, turned into something we could detect. Uh, and uh, you have to recognize First of all, you have to discriminate against the background. So we had three stages. You could reduce the background a factor of 100 by pumping in separately each stage. So that took some engineering. Then when you got in here, you had to recognize that by electron bombardment to create the ions, unlike our hot wire detector that created ions of anything that hit it, you only could ionize one in 1,000 or one in 10,000. So all the others were useless to you. If you allow them to hit anything, they create a, create a terrible background where you don't want it. So we just designed it 
if you uh, allow those to fly out a hole and go into the background. Very simple principle. But other people had tried this and decided the whole thing was hopeless because they put a wall right here. They were designing, looking for the signal. And, you know, you get the signal from something here, you don't worry what happens after that. Bad philosophy. Think of noise, then the signal takes care of itself. That's the, that's the lesson. I want you to understand there are philosophical lessons of wide application in what I'm talking about in this funny realm of intimate encounters with molecules. So that was one uh, major principle. The other was this pumping thing I described. And with it, it worked like a charm. First time we tried the apparatus. And it's largely, of course, due to Yuan's genius. Here's what he was like that. And there are a few people in the audience who know Yuan very well. He's gone on, of course, to a brilliant career. Uh, first in Chicago, then Berkeley, and Taiwan. Uh, I like to call him the Mozart of chemical physics. Uh, and he could make any experiment work. And two then first year graduate students worked on, with him building this apparatus and doing the early experiments. Pierre Le Breton and Doug McDonald both went on to distinguished academic uh, careers too. Uh, I guess you just quickly some samples. These are maps of intensity as a function of velocity. The product flew out in various directions and distribution and angle. I'm not even going to explain them right now, except in the most simple way, because we'll talk a little about what you learn from such things next time. I just want to survey the increasing sort of odyssey of teeming molecular wildness. So far, we've only tamed them by allowing them travel in these so-called beams that we've mechanically collimated, um, and we'll see what else we can do. But these are contour maps, such as you have uh, if you like to hike in the mountains. This one I'm only showing because it's symmetric, top and bottom here. Uh, this represents the direction in which the product's uh, reactants collide. In this case, is a chlorine atom reacting with an organic molecule that contains bromine. And you're going to wind up farming an organic molecule with chlorine and a free bromine. Uh, and we want to understand the mechanics of how that comes about. Uh, and here you see uh, there are two peaks symmetrical about the midpoint. So it shows the thing hangs together and then falls apart equally forward and backward. Uh, the lower one is a similar thing with a different choice of molecule and the peaks are very asymmetric. It shows you that the thing falls apart while it's rotating. Well, the complex, the collision complex. We know how long it takes to rotate, about a, a, a trillionth of a second it takes one of these molecules to turn around. And so we can see on that time scale, there is the same symmetry preserved. Just to give you an inkling of uh, how a chemist would think of it, one of those reactions, uh, it happens to be the uh, uh, lower one in this diagram, uh, the previous diagram, is what we call a reaction of vinyl bromide that has a two carbons with a double bond and the bromine attacked by chlorine. Uh, the chemistry is such the chlorine always attacks the end that's not already occupied by something. And then in order to uh, react and form uh, the new molecule, the product molecule, you have a problem because uh, you've disrupted the double bond by adding the chlorine to it. That means there's a free electron on the other end from which the chlorine added. And if you try to take the bromine off, you have another free valence here. You can see that must not be reasonable. You don't have to be a chemist to understand that, right? So the chlorine atom must migrate before it can leave. Well, that's relatively heavy and slow. Whereas in this case, the reactant that we call allyl bromide is such that uh, when you form an electron loose from adding chlorine to the double bond, it's in the middle. The electron is very light. It can move immediately. So this one gives you a symmetric distribution. Uh, sorry, this one gives you the asymmetric distribution because it decomposes very rapidly. This one's symmetric because it, it takes a while for the chlorine to migrate over to the other end. 
Why is that all that interesting? Well, from a chemical context, what is interesting is that just as in most cooking or committee work and so on, the more cooks you have, the more committee members you have, space quantization, uh, the slower things are, right? <laughs> so, the bond, similar bonds as you have in this case here, this should have taken longer to decay, in the way chemists usually think, than this. Because this has only two heavy atoms and some others involved. This has another one. And we get the opposite result. And you can understand it in these terms we just said. But that's something that chemists didn't understand until these experiments pointed out. Here's a favorite case I'm going to talk about next time. Because you may say, well, gosh, looks like everything's the same. That's the whole point. It was a shock. Here's uh, these similar kind of maps, this time showing the symmetry upstairs and downstairs. Remember, collision partners collide. This is a contour map. Intensity is a function of angle and velocity. So you go out for a while, there's nothing, and then you climb over a mountain and down. You see it's almost the same as the velocity distribution in any direction, but there's this crescent-like shape in the angle distribution. The shock was H plus Cl2 is the same one. And it's the same when you dissociate with light, a chlorine molecule. Next time I'll explain why that was so surprising. Uh, we still use 19th century notation indicating chemical reactions. And from that perspective, chemists would have expected no similarity between such details of mapping the distribution of product in such a reaction. And so that's uh, just a quick sample. Here, when you study related reactions, there's just the top half for conciseness of the map of HCl from H plus Cl2. Uh, when you do a related bromine, gee, it shifts sideways and still more sideways here. All that turned out to give us information about the forces that was very revealing in terms of how the electronic structure governed forces. These show the energy release and also changes in a way that was so revealing. So that's, I hope these quick glimpses give you some notion. Here's an example to show how cockeyed a distribution can be when you uh, have to switch two bonds at once. We'll talk about that next time in terms of what it means. I want to go on now to the Odyssey part. Uh, this is famous story of Maxwell's demon. Maxwell, Maxwell's equation, electromagnetism, was very interested in the details of molecules interacting. And in a discussion of uh, what's called the second law of thermodynamics, he described a hypothetical mon uh, a little demon who had the ability to sort fast from slow molecules. Um, and that's just, you know, uh, one of these Gedanken things. However, uh, we can do that and from uh, quite an early stage we're able to do it and again I think the general philosophical principles beyond this that uh, are worth mentioning. The original idea about making a molecular beam was to have a low pressure and tied to the chamber from which the molecules emerge so there wouldn't be a lot of collisions as the molecules came out because you wanted to get an undistorted sample of the gas inside. Well, we chemists, of course, had to cheat because we needed intensity desperately. So we pushed the pressure up high, and then we learned of work that engineers had done on gas flow, which showed you that it's very advantageous to go to very high pressures because the collisions that occurred then organized the beam. This is a very important principle. I have to stand at the right angle here. It's why molecular biology succeeded so brilliantly. The principle is let the bugs do the work, right? The scientists figured out how to let certain bugs snip the DNA at certain places and they pick up the pieces. The bugs did the hard work. Here, as the molecules collide like mad as they're coming out, they organize themselves. Now, it's a hard concept here where people are so polite, but in Boston, it's obvious. There's a department store called Filene's that has sales on Saturday mornings. There's always a big crowd anticipating bargains. So that's like the high pressure gas inside here. When the doors are flung open, the crowd rushes in. Everybody comes 
going through collisions in the same direction, in the same velocity, whether they want to or not. And if there's someone in the crowd who's especially excited at the prospect of bargains, who's jumping around, they suffer more collisions, even black eyes, bloody noses. If they're turning handstands, they're knocked down, they can't get, and so on. Well, the same thing with these molecular collisions. It organizes the beam. They come out, intensity you get, uh, you get narrow angular spread, narrow velocity distribution, the rotation is cooled down, like the hands, uh, hand stands are, are tumbling, low vibration, that is if the guy's waving their hands like vibration of a molecule, the atoms within a molecule, they suffer more, they cool down. If you want to accelerate somebody though, you know how to do that, you get a busload of kids, very light kids, and you mix a few heavy adults in them, and then the collisions of the kids rushing somewhere are going to boost the adults up to the same velocity as the kids. So that magnifies the energy, because the energy goes up like mass uh, and so on. And you can even uh, align the rotation of molecules through collisions. Uh, so it's incredibly useful, and all you need to do is use what had been regarded as illegally high pressure. So I, you see why I mention these details, bloody as they may seem, to give you a notion of what it was like to do early work in this field. Now, a harder problem, whoops, this is harder to see. I think my uh, unsophisticated PowerPoint is scattering in my screwed drawings. But what I want to emphasize here is another thing wrong with that hockey player cartoon was all the hockey players were upright, yeah, coming right in. Molecules don't behave that way. I mentioned they are tumbling. And in fact, uh, in this room, they're rattling around with the speed of rifle bullets and also tumbling with the peripheral velocity, the speed of a rifle bullet. It takes, a, as I mentioned, typically a trillionth of a second to tumble in and over in. So the hockey players would have been cartwheeling out of there, pinwheeling out. And how to take care of that? Uh, you'd like to orient them in an electric field, but the fact is uh, that means you have to interact with a, some distribution asymmetry in the distribution of electrons in the molecule. If the molecule is tumbling rapidly, that gets averaged out. So you can't grab them well enough to get any more than a very slight orientation. Now the, there's exception is certain molecules have shape that resembles a child's toy. I mean, many of you must have wound up these tops with a string and spin them, and you know they precess, they don't tumble. They're called symmetric tops by spectroscopists. And Dick Bernstein at Wisconsin and a former student of mine, Phil Brooks at Rice, both took advantage of that because they're sort of molecules that are already oriented. They don't tumble. But that was a limited variety. And one wanted to be able to do wider range. And to do that, uh, you're in the situation of wanting to do something like the backyard swing. You know, I enjoy pushing our grandkids now and they swings a lot. And I sometimes notice nearby what I take to be a frustrated parent who I can tell really wants to do this for their kid. But this is the way the molecules are usually going. And unless you can turn gravity way up, you can't get them to this. Uh, well, gravity in our case is the electric field interacting with the distribution of electrons in the molecule. Well, how to do it? Well, it's easy, but it was a long time. It took a while before people recognized this. How would you do it? You've already heard about this department store business, cooling things down. If you do that, you'll cool down the rotations, right? You expand through supersonic nozzle, the collisions, cool down the rotations so they're not rotating so fast. And then the interaction with the electric field can orient them and allow them just to oscillate back and forth. They'll be oriented in space. And it works. Here's an experimental demonstration. This, this kid didn't like us taking over the apparatus temporarily, but uh, this is what it is. We spoke of pendular molecules. And you can turn all kinds of molecules into t tiny pendula this way by just cooling down the rotation enough before you try to orient them. This turns out a huge advantage in interpreting experiments because instead of averaging out over the tumbling, either in spectroscopy or in reactions, you have them just oscillating back and forth, bringing molecules to attention, we like to call it. Okay, so that's part of taming molecular wildness. 
but it's not the whole story. I just have to mention this over, it's a little bit technical, but it's so cute. Um, you notice I'm not using many equations, and I don't need to do much here, except take a molecule that, uh, here's the simplest case, just two atoms, where the electron distribution is such that one end is more negative than the other. That's what the shading means. We call, say it has a dipole then. And the key thing is for such a molecule, the dependence on angle as it interacts with the electric field goes as what we call a cosine. Even if you're a little fuzzy in what the cosine was back in high school, it's just a function of an angle. Now, if, if there's no uh, asymmetry, you can still induce a dipole by a strong external field that uh, interacts with what's called a polarizability. That's sort of the cushiness of the electron cloud in the molecule. You put in a strong field, the image of the field, so to speak, makes a temporary dipole that interacts back with the field. That's why the field strength comes in squared. And that goes as a square of the cosine with these polarizabilities instead of what we call the dipole moment. Fine, all that's details, but the key thing is, when you do this using a laser to generate the field, you might worry, oh, the laser's oscillating back and forth, it's electric field, you know, that's the way light goes. It doesn't matter because it comes in squared. You still get the force the same way on the molecule. Now, if you take a molecule that has a dipole, it will also have a polarizability, and whenever you have that, the cosine squared is such that for either orientation, one end up or that other end down, you get the same interaction for this term. And uh, that means that even if the molecule is different and it's different in, in terms of the atoms, the interaction's the same. It seems funny, but that's the case. If the laser's strong enough, this interaction is such that there's a barrier restricting turning one to the other, and then the lowest states here happen to be double. There's a phenomenon called tunneling. You may have heard of that in quantum mechanics. You put something here, but it can get over here eventually by leaking through a barrier, which classically you couldn't do. Well, this phenomenon is such that it splits the levels, and because you have an interaction that is just the first power instead of the second power here, that connects them, as we say, and they split apart like mad. This gives a much stronger Stark effect. I go into all these kind of details just hoping you get some glimmering that by simply turning on a laser for a molecule like this, we know enough about the polarizability, the so-called dipole moment. We can predict what we need to do. We can turn on a much stronger Stark effect specifically for the one molecule, the one kind of molecule. We can pick it out of a crowd. It's just like, beam me up, Scotty. Pick me right out of the crowd. And this, again, all goes back to the auto staring stuff and so on, because we're using fields to pick out states and whatnot. Okay, that's the most highbrow stuff we need to do here. Um, well, this one is, is uh, interesting, too. We still haven't uh, satisfied ourselves with this taming molecular wildness, because when we collide these streams of molecular hockey players, they're not all lined up like those hockey players. So it's a spread. Huh? Quite a wide spread, because molecules are very small. Uh, if we plucked one of my hairs, which I can't afford to do, there's 10,000 that can fit across the width of one. So they're darn small. So we have no way to control exactly where those buggers are going. We have a beam, there's a lot of them over a certain spread. It'd be, you know, a quarter of a mile or so wide in the hockey player sized molecule. So that means like the Sultan's archers, it's like shooting arrows, but we can't guarantee where they hit because, you know, they're coming like this. So we got to average over that. That's terrible. We're losing some information. And what I want to tell you is it's actually possible to regain that information. See, I'm trying to point out the ideas that are fun and all have, I think, philosophical lessons applicable in the real world beyond this tiny world of molecular, intimate molecular interaction. What is the trick? What is the trick? Well, if you want to know where they go in scattering a certain direction, you measure more than one direction simultaneously. 
And that allows you, I won't go into any detail, to undo this thing. So it's a little like, we can't say, we can't control beforehand whether two molecules are gonna collide with one of them due east to the other or, in, or north, northeast, or quite how far out. How far out determines the force and how big the angle of deflection is. But we get that, that information directly. But we don't know whether the east, north, northeast, or whatever. It's just that the umpire doesn't know whether this high price pitcher is going to throw a pitch that goes low and inside or high and outside. But the umpire can call the pitch, presumably correctly, <laughs> afterwards. And that's what happens when you measure two angles at once. So again, it comes back to directions that Otto Stern's early work directed us to, if you like. So I just hope you get a glimmering that you can even figure that out. As if, even though the Sultan can't air, aim the arrow exactly because it can't get perfect initial conditions, you know where they hit. And that's very valuable information for understanding chemistry. Now, if, uh, I'll finish very quickly. Uh, you may have heard of wave particle duality, that uh, the whole story, the romance of the quantum about uh, insight into the structure of matter and how it governs everything we deal with in the ordinary level and far beyond, both in the inner and outer cosmos in the world, is governed by quantum mechanics. And particles, matter acts like waves in some circumstances and like particles in others. And there's something we call a de Broglie wavelength associated with motion of atoms or molecules. Its magnitude is given by Planck's constant, a very small number, but so important because it governs everything in the, of the quantum phenomena, the mass, the velocity. And so that you have a wave character to the motion of the atom or molecule. And I just remind us, just the distance between two crests or two troughs. Uh, now the convenient unit we use to talk about the size of atoms and molecules is a so-called angstrom unit, which is uh, one, uh, I guess, one hundred millionth of a centimeter. Uh, ten with minus eight, that is divided by ten to the eighth power. And for, um, for example, an electron uh, moving with one percent of the speed of light, which is essentially what it does in, say, the hydrogen atom, uh, the, it would be three angstroms. That's sort of the periphery of a hydrogen atom. It's an electron you know, that sort of magnitude. Um, and the, the motion of the atom, the overall motion of the atom itself, which is, of course, much heavier, about 2,000 times heavier than the electron, uh, you can achieve uh, one angstrom even at room temperature, where it's moving pretty fast, fairly high velocity as molecules go. Uh, you can, however, if you slow down the velocity enough, which means going to very low temperature, uh, for example, get a very long thousand angstrom wavelength. So then the hydrogen atoms and other atoms begin to lose their individuality. If their waves are long enough, they, so to speak, don't know where they should be along the wave. You can't localize a wave the way you can a particle. And all kinds of fabulous phenomena uh, occur change the nature of chemistry because chemistry, the electrons usually have wave characters so pronounced you have to treat them by these quantum methods, whereas the nuclei and the atoms themselves are heavy and the molecule heavy enough that the wavelength is very short and doesn't show up. We don't have to take account of this wave character when we talk about baseballs, except in certain pitchers like Tim Wakefield of the Red Sox when he throws a knuckleball and the wind catches it. These guys must think that it's a wave effect, but it's really not. The wavelength of a baseball is very short. It's so heavy. Okay, now we wanted, as other people did, to try to develop a way to slow down the molecules because then we can make long waves. And then we could enter and study phenomena in this domain where the wave character was so important changes all the nature of chemistry. And 
I show this, which some of you will recognize as the Guggenheim Bilbao Museum in, in Spain. Uh, when I saw pictures of this, I said, oh, it's another guy trying to pretend he's Picasso. But it's really a tremendously exciting building. And what was so striking for me was to discover she's in titanium. The reason is that Frank Geary, the architect, in the early 90s when this was going up, intended to sheath it in, in copper, but then realized, oh my gosh, in a quarter of a century, in an urban environment, the copper would be chewed away. And then he discovered he could get titanium sheets cheap. Why? See, it's all chemistry. The Iron Curtain had fallen, therefore titanium became cheap. <laughs> Why? The Russians mined titanium, and they had rolled out a lot of it as the ideal material for missile sheathing. So you have a case, instead of beating uh, swords into plowshares, it's beating missiles into a museum. May more of this happen. But it's awesome because when the wind blows, these sheets are a third of a millimeter thick. They quiver. So it is like a, the scales on a big fish. If you haven't seen this building, it's an experience. Please do it. Why was I so excited? Because years before, I had read about high-speed rotation and learned that titanium is the best thing to make a high-speed rotor run. Because you see, if you rotate fast enough, something will blow up. It's like ice skating, which you don't get to do much of here, but back home you do. You crack the whip and people hang together, go faster and faster. At some point, people on the end have to holler to their nearest partner, hang on! If they don't hear, whoops! They don't hang on, they fly off. That's exactly what happens when your rotor goes. The outside atoms have to ask their neighbors to hold on, almost literally. It turns out it's the speed of sound in the metal that determines when it blows apart. When the peripheral velocity is bigger than the speed of sound, it blows apart. That's, the, that's what it really is. It's that simple. And titanium, having very high tensile strength and a low density, has a very, uh, very high speed of sound, so you can go to high velocity. Well, that made me think the way to do it. And you would think of it too, if you had this background. Here's the way to make slow molecules, at least one way we are using our lab. There are other ways in other labs I won't talk about right now. Uh, it, you have a little spindle, you have this uh, tube, you're gonna flow glass in here, it'll come out of a little orifice. This is gonna be one of our supersonic beams. We get high enough pressure so there are collisions as they come out, but now, if I want to aim the beam that direction, I'm going to spin the rotor in the opposite direction. So you see, it's like shooting a bullet down there, because molecules move with speed of bullets, usually, in ordinary conditions. In fact, from supersonic expansions, they typically move a little faster. But if I'm pulling the gun back with the speed of a bullet, and the bullet just moves very slowly away. That's the whole idea. And that means you rotate this little baby at 45,000 RPM to get the peripheral velocity of several hundred meters per second when the molecules come out. And this is the work of a graduate student. Uh, oh yeah, then I found again in Berkeley a connection, advertising lightweight nozzles, because that's what you want to use in this case. And I was, you know, again, very impressed. Notice it was uh, when I was at the, the uh, symposium honoring Harold Johnston that I noticed this and snapped it. Okay, so you understand the kind of equipment you need. I won't go into detail here except that you can lower the velocities dramatically in this method. And the key thing is, here's Manish, the graduate student who did this work. Here he is holding his little rotor. And then I asked him to pose in the classic pose of Mercury. You remember that guy running so fast? But I said, look backwards, because this is what we like to call a counter-revolutionary rotor to make slow molecules. So that's what he's doing, holding the broom, which, you know, that symbol thing that Mercury usually carries. Now, I go into all of this because uh, I hope you 
get a feeling, you know, there's something kind of maverick and uh, homespun and so forth about the stuff these guys do. Can this really be serious? Well, I hope you see that we do enjoy it, but it also, as I hope to show you next time, has yielded remarkable insight into a lot of phenomena. I want to end with one brief story that um, I love very much and have told my students. Uh, it has to do, again, with Berkeley. I must not move from the right direction. Uh, at Berkeley, there's no final ceremony of a pseudo exam for a PhD candidate. Instead, the candidate brings his thesis separately to three members of their committee and comes back a week later for their signature. Well, in this case, the candidate, in my first year on the faculty here, came uh, to get his signed sheet. And he happened to be a physics student in Professor Nirenberg's group that I got acquainted with. He was a very low-key guy. But when he came to get the signature, he seemed even more excited than I would have anticipated from a guy just completing his PhD. So I asked him, why? He said, well, I, I've just done something I always wanted to do, but I couldn't do it until I turned in my thesis. What was that? Well, in those days, you could go to Oakland Airport and rent an airplane, a biplane, with a pilot in front, and you're in back, and learn to fly. He said, I couldn't do that until I turned in my thesis. I might have got killed. <laughs> I mentioned this, it shows the right attitude that the students, and people who are interested in pursuing this sort of thing have. And I mention that also because this guy, who was so low key, somehow got elected later in life to the House of Representatives. His name is Vern Ayler, he's from Michigan, and I've urged him to tell the story to his colleagues in the Congress so they would have the proper appreciation of the spirit with which science is pursued at Berkeley and elsewhere. And since he hasn't done so, as far as I know, I tell you in hopes that you might repeat this story and will propagate to a few Congress people and so on. Anyhow, thank you for your kind attention as I tell you these stories. Uh, maybe they were a little more intimate than you wanted to hear about molecules. If they're not quite enough intimate, be sure to come next time because that's when we really get to the hot stuff. Thank you. I guess just a sort of a quick technical question with this uh, counter uh, counter spinning jet. How does that compare in doing these experiments to uh, these atom lasers in cold atoms? Yeah, the question which I didn't I was trying to finish in a reasonable time, so I didn't mention that in physics, as you probably read in the paper for some years now, they've been able to trap slow and trap atoms. Um, and of course, we wanted to emulate that uh, with molecules. It turns out it's much harder to do with molecules. The laser method that works with atoms doesn't work with molecules because in the laser case, it depends on being able to pump, as we say, an electronic transition where you can keep putting in the same size light quantum over and over again, and then as it bounces out, it slows down the atom. But in molecules, because they have these internal states of vibration of the atoms and states associated with rotation, if you hit them with a light quantum, you don't get the same light quantum back. It gets spread all over the place. And so it just doesn't work. You need a different method. And several methods are being tried in different labs. I think I can honestly say this is the most rudimentary one. <laughs> that doesn't mean it will do all that well, and it hasn't allowed us to slow things enough to trap them yet. But, but we've been able to make them slow enough to do some very interesting things. 
I might mention it, is Harvey Gould here. He, I got to visit him uh, on the lab. He has a very beautiful experiment there where he uses gravity to slow cesium atoms that he slowed with laser to begin with. And so, so there's some very elegant experiments going on with these atoms that have acquired long wavelengths. So they behave almost like light. Uh, it's quite wonderful. And years from now, maybe we'll have atom flashlights and so on. Who knows? You know, we'll see.